FM radio transmission picked up from Ganymede, a moon of Jupiter which Galileo found the largest moons of Jupiter known 411 years ago. On January 7, 1610, Italian scientist Galileo Galilei observed the planet Jupiter via his freshly enhanced 20-power handmade telescope, first mistaking the three additional points of light for far-off stars. He watched them over several nights and saw that they seemed to move against the background stars, staying close to Jupiter but shifting their locations in relation to one another. Then, he noticed a fourth star close to the planet exhibiting the same peculiar activity. By January 15th, Galileo correctly deduced that they were moons orbiting Jupiter rather than stars, so supporting the Copernican theory that the majority of celestial objects did not revolve around the Earth. Galileo reported his observations of additional astronomical phenomena and his discoveries of Jupiter's satellites in a book titled Sidereus Nuncius in March 1610. Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto continue to be the most well-known of Jupiter's 79 known satellites as of today. They inhabit intriguing worlds. Oceans that might harbor life could be hidden by some. The Juno probe, according to NASA, has discovered an FM radio signal emanating from one of these massive moons. How did NASA discover the signal, and where did it come from? Learn more about the odd signal coming from Ganymede by watching this video with me. Everyone's attention was lately drawn to anything that occurred. For the first time since it was launched, NASA's Juno spacecraft is still out there roving across space. It discovered an FM radio signal coming from Ganymede, a moon of Jupiter. This signal is very similar to one that we would find on Earth. We refer to this signal as Wi-Fi and utilize it virtually daily. Even you probably have Wi-Fi at home. So, did we just catch a broadcast from an alien radio station coming from Ganymede? Is Ganymede equipped with Wi-Fi? We need to learn more about this frigid alien land in order to figure that out. The largest moon in the solar system is called Ganymede. Given that it is bigger than Mercury, if it were orbiting the Sun, it would be a planet in and of itself. Although Ganymede lacks an atmosphere, it is the only moon that is known to possess a strong magnetosphere, which occasionally causes auroras that are influenced by the moon's subsurface saltwater oceans. Researchers now have evidence that suggests Ganymede's subsurface oceans may be liquid and extremely salty due to the shaking observed in the auroras. Electrons and electromagnetic fields gave rise to the FM signal that came from Ganymede, forcing the electrons to whirl and oscillate at a rate that is slower than their spin rate. In late 2020, when Ganymede approached a region of Jupiter where the gas giant's magnetic field interacts with it, the Juno probe picked up a five-second radio burst. It's probably not aliens, NASA Utah Ambassador Patrick Wiggins said. It's not E.T. Wiggins stated. It serves a more organic purpose. The Ganymede moon's magnetic field lines potentially converge in a region of Jupiter where the Juno mission was traveling. Juno began to pick up the radio source at that point. To investigate how Jupiter developed and changed over time, Juno was sent into space. To tell the tale of Jupiter's creation and evolution is Juno's main objective. Juno will study Jupiter's gravity and magnetic fields, as well as the dynamics and composition of its atmosphere, using time-tested technologies on a spinning spacecraft placed in an elliptical polar orbit. In contrast to extraterrestrials, electrons were the cause of the moon's radio transmissions. Electrons oscillate at a lower rate than they spin, which leads them to quickly magnify radio waves. This phenomenon is known as cyclotron maser instability. Although a noteworthy discovery, the radio emissions were only picked up for five seconds by the circling spacecraft. Juno accelerated to a dazzling 111,847 miles per hour. With that speed, it would take under two minutes to travel from coast to coast across the whole United States. However, why are radio waves so crucial? 
In order to understand what is going on in the magnetic fields of those same worlds, scientists are interested in detecting radio emission from planets and other entities. The circumstances on the planet's surface are then influenced by those magnetic fields. For instance, the magnetic field of Earth preserves the atmosphere that allows us to survive. These magnetic fields can also provide information to scientists about a world's structure and history. The magnetic field of a planet, which arises from its core and prevents the atmosphere from being lost to space by deflecting the charged particles of the stellar wind. Since the magnetic field of the Earth shields us from dangerous radiation, magnetic fields created by the cooling of a planet's interior may do the same for life on its surface. As you can see, it's a crucial consideration. One of the most prevalent types of stars in the cosmos is low mass. Astronomers can more easily target planets that circle nearby stars for study because, when they transit or pass in front of their host system, they block a greater percentage of light than if they did so across a more massive star. The habitable zone, which is where an orbiting planet receives the heat required to keep liquid water on its surface, is also located very close and since such a star is small and dim, a planet that is so close to its star is also subject to the star's strong gravitational pull, which could cause it to become tidally locked such that one side of it is always facing the star it orbits, similar to how the moon orbits the Earth. The planet experiences tidally generated heat, also known as tidal heating, as a result of the star's gravitational pull. The most volcanically active body in our solar system, Jupiter's moon Io, is propelled by tidal heating. So is it possible that Ganymede has life? So, apart the fact that Ganymede is extremely cold, with temperatures hovering around minus 186 degrees Fahrenheit, we can be certain that the signal did not come from extraterrestrial life. Yet the Galileo probe discovered a copious stream of atomic hydrogen escaping from the moon's incredibly thin atmosphere during one of its flybys. This indicates that a significant amount of oxygen is trapped within or floating above its ice surface. Due to the fact that atomic hydrogen is the lightest atom and Ganymede's gravitational field is weak, the hydrogen escapes while the atomic oxygen remains in place. According to some scientists, Ganymede may have the same amount of oxygen on its frozen surface as the Earth does in its atmosphere. Could Ganymede's waters below the surface provide everything necessary for life to exist? There is a need for a mission to investigate the theory put forth by certain experts that any ocean beneath this planet would experience pressures so great that they would cause it to freeze. According to experts, extremophiles are microbes that can survive in the boundary between Ganymede's core and mantle which would undoubtedly be the largest discovery ever broadcast on Earth, while not being as exciting as discovering fully developed sentient life. The final segment of the film is for you if you enjoy biology. We mentioned that the moons of Jupiter might support extreme temperature life. The tardigrade, sometimes referred to as water bears or moss piglets, is the most well-known species of extremophile creature. According to the website of the Royal Society of Biology, tardigrades are very small creatures, the majority of them are less than one millimeter in size, that dwell in water or the water film that covers silt, mosses, and lichens. There are roughly 1,000 species that are known, but more are being discovered every year, and DNA barcoding indicates that the real number could be far higher. Tardigrata is a separate phylum that tardigrades belong to because of their distinct body structure. Its mouth is located right at the front of the head, giving them a distinctive face. Before food is sucked up, it is pierced by the pharynx's two different types. Each of their four body parts has two pairs of short legs. They have four segmental ganglia along their ventral side, paired nerve connections, and a brain. They belong to the superfluum ectozoa, which also contains the arthropods, insects, spiders, crabs, and allies, the nematodes, roundworms, and other less well-known molting groups. Due to one important characteristic, they shed their skin as they grow. The lives of tardigrades are inconspicuous. They don't spread illness, they don't harm crops, and they hardly ever appear in wildlife movies. 
They are, nonetheless, adored. Most people, both scientists and non-scientists, who find a tardigrade under a microscope remark on how cute they are. Their common names, water bears or moss piglets, reflect this sentiment. It is simple to get caught up in the drama of their existence as they wander around under the microscope, clinging to moss leaves and, supposedly, peering around with their little eye spots. There are two scientific themes that have sparked interest in tardigrades. One is a desire to comprehend their place in the evolutionary tree of animal life, as well as how body plans develop and where the most successful animals on the earth, arthropods and nematodes, originated. How is a tardigrade's body plan created? We must research this. A tardigrade's alien-like appearance, according to someone. The tardigrade may really be the best alien contender to find in the cosmos out of all the animals on Earth. This is due to the fact that tardigrades are known to be able to survive for decades without food or water, temperatures that range from close to absolute zero to well above the water's boiling point, pressures that range from close to zero to well above that on ocean floors, and direct radiation exposure. 2011 saw a test of these extremophiles long-distance survival outside of an orbiting space shuttle. Tardigrades can repair their own DNA and can lower the percentage of water in their bodies to a few percent, which helps explain why they are so hardy. When the Russian mission Phobos Grunt launched towards the Martian moon Phobos, some of these tiny water bears nearly became extraterrestrial, but they remained on Earth when a rocket failed and the capsule remained in Earth orbit. Over the majority of the planet, tardigrades are more prevalent than people. An electron micrograph with color enhancement shows a millimeter-long tardigrade crawling over moss. Where on Earth can we locate tardigrades? Nearly every environment on Earth is home to tardigrades, from mountaintops to the bottom of the sea, from tropical rainforests to the Antarctic, the phylum has been observed. The ability to resist and reproduce in space, however, is the most intriguing feature. Isn't it incredible? What are your thoughts on this video? Tell us in the comments section below and see you on the channel again soon.